So I am uh, Dan Adams. This is Marie Adams. Uh, so we'd like to start by specifically thanking the Architectural League and most uh, specifically Anna Rieselbach. Um, it's just been a sort of great pleasure to be working here for the past few days with everyone on hand. <coughs> We'd also like to very specifically thank all the people that worked on our installation, which for us was a fairly large undertaking. We'd like to specifically thank Allison Wright, Kelly Johnson, Ryan Gagnabin, and Zach Angles. So the title of our presentation tonight is Primary Industry, and we will present our interest in designing the dimensions between industry and the city. To begin, we will present what we see as two industrial acts that circumscribe an idea of primary industry. The first is the famous image of Gandhi bending over to simply pick up recently evaporated salt from coastal waters of Dundee. This is best known as a political act of civil disobedience to challenge British colonization of India. Specifically to us, though, we are most fascinated by the designed act of questioning the boundary between fundamental systems of the nature <coughs> and the transition of these natural systems to industrial systems. In the simple act of picking up salt, Gandhi was asking, am I now participating in a fundamental natural right? Is this biologic, like breathing air? Or am I now partaking in the industrialization of the landscape? Is this ultimately an urban act? For us, this simple act, this simple translation, is an initial act, an act that compounds, aggregates, and expands, ultimately manifesting in the form and life of the contemporary city. The second act occurs at a critical moment in the history of industrialization and globalization, at the meeting point of the first trans transcontinental railroad across the western frontier of the United States. Golden Spike National Monument, where Murray is standing, where a railroad spike of gold was driven into the earth to commemorate the new linkage and final mechanized conquest of the continent. In some ways we could understand it as the sort of the first hula hoop of the earth. This moment is a brief but significant event set within a dramatically longer geologic process still occurring today. Lake Bonneville, a massive lake which today continues to evaporate in Utah, enacting the same chemical process harnessed by Gandhi and leaving behind a massive expanse of a crystallized landscape known as the Great Salt Lake in the Bonneville Salt Flats. As the lake evaporates, its minerals and are densified and deposited on the earth, and a crust of salt results. Microscopically, salt crystals are in a perpetual state of reformulation with changing water quantities. <laughs> Across the terrain, millions of crystals grow in a spiraling pattern of molecular growth. As the water varies in salinity, algae blooms occur, varying the tone of the water, famously resulting in the muted pink to blood red tones of the lake. This evaporation induced densification of mineral deposits can be seen as a naturally fueled industrial machine. Such an industrially efficient generator is a magnetic attractor for industrial development, not only instigating the transcontinental railroad to swing by the evaporated landscape, but also the development of the stone jetties like cilia along the edge of the lake to provide access to the mineral deposits. This is an oil access jetty. <coughs> the spiral jetty conflates the microscopic with the geologic event, merging the form of the salt's crystal growth structure with a truck turning radius and deploying it at such a scale that it accelerates the evaporative processes of the lake, trapping and increasingly stagnating the water. Smithson's jetty is not simply a spiral of stones growing salt, but also an active reflection of the industrial and geologic process of the lake. Two spirals, one white and one red. Across the circumference of the lake, the same process is undertaken by dozens of mineral extraction industries, industries whose operative model is the amplification of natural process for industrial production, where the conceived boundaries between industry and nature are challenged, like the dual reading form and process in Smithson's jetty. The industrial practice of amplifying natural evaporation prompts transformations across multiple systems. And like Smithson's propagation of red water, <coughs> the same operations at Morton Salt Company here to produce and distribute water softener to be sold at Walmart. And in the background you see the train commemorated at Golden Spike National Monument. And like the red algae that occurs at the spiral jetty here, 
indirect reverberations occur through the landscape. This is the pond tender. In the propagation of brine flies, so as the water becomes increasingly briny, different blooms of algae and different blooms of insects occur that lay their eggs, <laughs> attracting thousands of migratory birds to the industrial salt pond, ponds. We're at the spiral jetty. We question what spiral do we see? Is it the rock jetty or the trapped salt water? Similarly, at the Morton facility, we question whether they are producing salt or attracting birds. While Gandhi and Smithson show us that the line between industry, human culture, and nature is very thin and perhaps irresolvable, we are simultaneously interested in the opposite. Where industry intersects the city in a meeting that can best be described as a collision, the relationship is a fascinating yin and yang where mutually dependent systems are seen as conflicting opposites. In homage to this condition of the city, our work here is framed through two ubiquitous industrial materials, salt and asphalt. While it was not our intention to enter architecture first through salt and then through asphalt, these materials have proven to be revealing and opposite yet complementary partners, a yin and yang between industry and the city. These are photographs of Chelsea, Massachusetts in Boston. And these are photographs of Staten Island, New York, the North Shore of Staten Island. This is the manifestation of a global transposition, wherein the primary industrial processes of one landscape are recast into the urban fabric of another. We interpret this transposition as a generator of great density, not conventional density in the sense of built square footage or numbers of inhabitants, but a density of overlapping interests and systems, wherein the ecologic, industrial, and urban coalesce, and global forces and highly localized negotiations conflate. Where a harbor seal, that's alive, basks on a dock next to car parking for the airport, next to jet fuel storage tanks, united by a federal navigation channel. We see this density as a charged and friction-filled concoction, which creates the opportunity for translation into new urban form and experience. The Panamax vessel is a translator of global infrastructure, economies, and productive landscapes into the urban context. Through the Panamax, the dimensions of the Panama Canal reverberate across the ocean into cities across the world. The economy of the salt trade today fuels 50,000 ton deliveries of salt in 900 foot long shifts, comparable to skyscrapers turned sideways that slip into harbor creeks, rivers, and inlets and into the fabric of the city. The scale of this arrival becomes uniquely reflected in the shoreside terminals that receive the ship's cargo, not only through the scale and geometry of the terminal's footprint, but also in its embedded capacity to receive and manage the kinetic characteristics of global industrial arrival. Specifically, the road salt de-icing industry is part of a dynamic but regular and predictable seasonal cycle where every summer, as the winter demand diminishes, the dock becomes operationally dormant and nearly empty, and we develop ways to re-inhabit the landscape in the interim. This is the Lumen Installation and Performance Arts Festival organized by Staten Island Arts, where we created a series of salt scaffold landscapes. Um, these are opened frameworks exploiting the specific capacity of dock workers and machines to configure piles of material that loosely imply uses and spatial boundaries. In this case, the salt pile grid and the S configuration were not pre-choreographed with the artist, but were rather absorbed by artists and spectators spontaneously as pedestal, gallery, and as medium. For lumen, we specifically we specify evaporated salt from Mexico or Australia. Like the evaporative environment of Smithson's jetty, the industrial processes and solar evaporation fields result in new crystal growths that are delicate or even soft and fluffy in consistency and when piled are comfortable to touch, climb, and dig. Because the crystals are freshly grown from ocean water, the salt is also free of other minerals that would discolor it which makes it serve well as a projection screen. This is the network of sites that feed salt to New York City and Boston, where in much of the recent design of industry and industrial process has tended to containerize and isolate industrial operations from the city. The salt industry in East Coast US cities is still legible. This is the accumulated geologic strata of a salt pile constructed over one year in Boston. 
Each deposited layer is embedded with properties translated from geologic processes from various geographies. As at Bonneville, salt deposits are a stage in the evaporative process of oceans, seas, and lakes. As an ocean evaporates, the salt is a deposited residue, <laughs> is a deposited residue, is captured through industrial process. Capturing the evaporated ocean in one location, transporting it, delivering it, and using it, in this case to de-iced roads, and then allowing it to re-enter into our contemporary oceans, only to know that someday that same salt will again exist in an evaporated landscape. Through this medium, it is clear when holding a crystal of salt that you are holding something that has existed in various form and chemical composition for the entire history of Earth. In Chile, the salt is mined in a region known as the Atacama Desert, a geographic region defined by a specific climatic effect called the rain shadow, where in this region of the des desert it has not rained for 5,000 years. Here, extremely pure minerals are found under a thin layer of dusty sand. The salt is simply cracked from the Earth's surface. I should say it, this is just an interesting factoid, I suppose. <laughs> Manhattan in a winter like, or the five boroughs of New York in something like the last winter uses approximately one million tons of salt. This is the moment where we were commemorating one million of to tons of salt in Chile. So you can imagine each winter the five boroughs of New York produce this somewhere in the world. In contrast, a much more anciently evaporated ocean now resides under Carrickfergus, Northern Ireland. Here, the former ocean exists as crusts of salt now overlain with 1,000 feet <coughs> of more recently deposited earth. Today, humans work within these layers of time to extract specific moments, literally traveling through time to capture specific values, just as the transcontinental railroad swept by the Great Salt Lake of Utah to capture the environmental capacity of that landscape. The salt piles in urban harbors are locations where these histories are again crossed in time and ultimately remixed into the chemistry of the city. While the shore is often described as an urban edge, it is the center of convergence where the global operations of industry meet the activity and topography of the city. The city looked down to the center of convergence, creating a relationship where waterfront industrial terminals often become a kinetically performative horizon to the city. As mentioned earlier, the salt in the city is regulated by the global module of the Panamax. In 50,000 ton increments, the city's horizon is recomposed as deliveries are deposited on the shore. Today, the view might be clear. Tomorrow, the site might be filled with freshly evaporated ocean from Mexico. Days later, a new geologic strata thousands of years earlier from Chile. And then from Northern Ireland, millions of years earlier, making legible the recomposition of earthly geology. Like Smithson's jetty, we see our work is embedded within the material systems of industry. Our work does not aim to contain or formalize the industry, but rather to become a new dimension within the industry's operations. In this case, we project light to engage the embedded kinetic and communicative properties of the industry to link operations in participation with the city, where weather events, shipping arrivals, and very local occurrences are drawn together in dialogue. We find parallels with infrastructures like highway viaducts, wherein a regionally scaled resource imposes external forces into the urban fabric. Here, we dissect the, the viaduct structure as a system of formally generative forces. Like the rain shadow that creates the Atacama Desert in Chile, we are interested in the dynamic shadow of the elevated highway, studying the volume of light, the conveyance of water, and an implied envelope of a maintenance ritual. Here, the material fact that the concrete exists in a perpetual process of decay instigates a maintenance strategy where, across the massive structure, every inch of concrete is, is inspected on a regular basis. So the parameter of reach from a man lift is translated into a series of shared use paved plates within a landscape that is otherwise consumed in this design for managing rainwater caught by the viaduct, creating a new programmatic typology. This translation of industrial performance into the city for us is a distant successor of the culture of congestion where instead of eating oysters on the end floor with boxing gloves on, one might find themselves playing basketball while workers are inspecting highways on lifts overhead. At show, Ledoux was filling two roles, simultaneously the Minister of Salt and Minister of Architecture. 
In this dual capacity, Ledoux developed a plan to situate industrial production as a fully integrated dimension of urban life, where wood harvesting and brine boiling merge with worshiping, recreating, sleeping, and gardening in urban form, an early constructed culture of congestion. In this photo, we're in a resident's bedroom looking at the mine manager's Oculus window. <coughs> Much like the Panamax vessel of today, the city of show is akin to a UFO deposited in an environment to tap specific resources. In this case, to tap the great forest of show for fuel to, to boil brine. In pursuit of an efficient machine, the form of the city radiates from the industry. The city is servant and served, and the image of the city's productive capacity is literally cast in stone. Here, Ledoux packages industrial process into architectural form and architectural detail. Through his own drawing, though his own drawings don't belie the inability of conventional architecture to simply serve as a container for the industry to occur, or in the case for the industry to escape, in the form of the steam cloud that escapes from, overwhelms, and consumes the architecture. The name of our firm, Landing Studio, comes from here. If Ledoux is responding to a centralized state of industry and the city, each fully intertwined with the other, we focus on the contemporary state of decentralized industry. We ask not how to design the city and industry as one unit, but rather to intersect them. Whether this intersection is a glance or a collision, this is the intersection of the fundamental things we translate from the world and the environments that we build from these translations. <laughs> and this collision reverberates through the city across broad dimensions. In Chelsea, Massachusetts, the friction between industry and the city has become most pronounced. Fearful of trends in cities like Boston and New York, where indeed industrialization of the waterfront made such places increasingly dependent on inefficient transportation methods, namely trucking, from displaced industrial sites, federal agencies like the Office of Coastal Zone Management have implemented strong measures <coughs> to preserve and promote maritime industrial operations for the protection of regional resilience. The consequence of such measures is the burden of carrying a region's industrial load on the shoulders of very localized urban environments. In turn, these cities react with zoning and legislation aimed at deterring industry from the city. Through this deadlocked negotiation and failure to land industry within the systems of the city, the shore, which is a powerful urban ecotone, is universally degraded between all competing interests. Today, the predominant use of the shore in places like Chelsea, Massachusetts, and Staten Island, New York, is car parking and car scrapping. In contrast to a culture of congestion, so for example in this photograph between the steel and the oil tank farm is overflow car rental. In contrast to a culture of congestion here, the overlapping density of interest does not result in the dynamic set of juxtapositions suggested by Coolhouse, but is instead a stagnating force. In the case of this asphalt batching terminal, competing regulations between the city and state cancel each other out such that the only allowable use is the terminal <coughs> of the terminal was to remain as an asphalt batching plant, which is a known carcinogen and horrible for resp respiratory systems in cities. But that was the only allowable legal use of the terminal. This next project, Rock Chapel Marine, does not follow the typical post-industrial development model for replacing industrial sites with conventional urban fabric, nor does it integrate city and industry like Ledoux. But here we aim to tune and translate industrial operations and capacity for new urban performance. Rock Chapel Marine is the design conversion of a 13 million gallon jet fuel and asphalt batching terminal into a shared use salt dock and public access landscape. This project would become the first public access into Chelsea's industrial waterfront in 100 years. So the period of demolition is not a matter of removal, but a matter of reintroduction. Over this three month period, we projected a series of images alluding to the future occupation of the landscape on the disappearing tank farm to frame this act. The industrial operations of the site could be roughly divided into two categories, fixed physical structures and kinetic operations. The physical structures themselves are inanimate forms, but they are encoded with operative characteristics that influence the activation of the landscape. The kinetic operations are the day-to-day -day performances or acts of the industry, the flexible systems that animate the landscape. Our gallery installation here is a growing catalog of the fixed structures and evidence of the operations that we engage in our work. The immediate appearance of the marine dock is deceptive. At first glance, it seems open and clear of physical structures. 
However, similar to the highway viaduct, the ground is highly articulated and embedded with varying performative potentials that we see as paramount to unlock new uses. Across the length of this landscape, simple shifts in the construction of the water's edge have significant influence on use. Where a steel bulkhead is valuable for mooring ships in deep water, and shallower sloped riprap hinders large vessels but is valuable for habitat. Embedded underground, massive utility corridors are reflected at the surface in the form of easements. These easements impose certain restrictions on industrial use. For instance, heavy stockpiles of material cannot be stored in these zones, thus setting the stage for other programmatic introductions. In this case, as a planning strategy that we call parks over pipes. We find that without this type of careful research of site, that these industrial sites are otherwise seen as a homogenous whole and relegated to single uses or left to stagnate. Simultaneous to a dissection of the embedded structures of the ground, we choreograph the industrial operations based on the particularities of the industry. As shown through the changing Mexican, Irish, and Chilean horizon of the city, basalt itself is a kinetic landform, changing in response to global deliveries, weather events, and seasonal cycles. The design of the landscape, therefore, is not fixed, but rather a series of contingent strategies. Where depending on quantities of salt on the dock, different design scenarios are enacted. In this case, with the organizing logic of sculpting view corridors from public streets between piles to the waterfront. As mentioned in the example of the Lumen Festival, this is a seasonal industry where operations are active during the winter and stockpiles reduce in the summer. In contrast, in the cold weather of New England, the seasonal shift is reversed for much outdoor recreation, making salt docks and outdoor recreation a surprisingly well-suited pair for a denser, more dynamic landscape occupation. In Chelsea now, each spring, after clearing the dock of salt, the site is open for waterfront basketball, a bike track, and events. Tank farms are made up of an assemblage of discrete architectural elements, each de designed to negotiate between a specific and usually simple industrial action and some characteristic of the local environment. During the demolition of the asphalt terminal, we catalog the elements and their embedded logics of lifting, containing, and covering to translate them from industrial operations into a new public engagement with the industrial landscape. Domes for defendi <coughs> defending tanks against snow loads, which were implemented in Boston after the blizzard of 1978, are lightweight, massive span structures. Retuned <coughs> we retune these as support scaffolds for lighting, flowering vines, and to provide shading over the landscape. The fairly amazing structures are sort of the evolution of the Buckminster Fuller. These are 90 foot. Uh, diameter aluminum uh, I-beam constructions. Each I-beam is approximately one-eighth inch thick material with a five-inch total depth. <coughs> Those are former fire extinguishing cannons from the oil terminal that are now water cannons for kids. Loading racks designed to interface between petroleum barges at varying tide levels. <coughs> we translated here as viewing platforms, pre-calibrated for viewers to see the decks of passing barges. And we cut down a jet fuel tank retention dike designed to retain the pressure of rapid outfall and filled this with soil as an amphitheater oriented to the water. This was just the sort of surveying of how to cut the tanks down. The construction of the landscape was also designed around the specific capacities of the salt dock operations. The project was designed to be built by salt workers over the industry's dormant spring and summer months. Because of its past use as an asphalt terminal, the site is required to be capped by an environmental cover, necessitating a specific cut fill strategy for balancing soil on the site and creating a buffer for the public from impacts of past industrial uses. In this context, we designed a mound-based landscape strategy, sort of like mini salt piles, wherein the equipment used to shovel and pile salt could be utilized to construct the environmental cover. The clean cover piles are organized in hedgerows on the site, similar but at a much smaller scale to how salt is stockpiled, that create a grain slash axis between the city and water, but also allowed the large construction vehicles of the salt dock to back their way out of the park area and into the dock as construction progressed. The vehicles retreated to the dock throughout the period of construction. Other elements like the tugboat cabin were negotiated from a local ship scrap yard and we utilized dock cranes to lift and position. 
easily moving a 30 ton steel ship cabin is a unique capacity afforded from working on an industrial dock. Lastly, to close our discussion of the yin and yang between asphalt and salt and between industry and city, and to further obscure the edge between industry and nature, a final translation. While tearing down the asphalt batching plant, we were mandated by the Department of Environmental Protection to prevent liquid asphalt from coming into contact with the ground, as this would constitute an oil spill. Later in the project, to construct an environmental cover to protect the workers and the public from historic contaminants, we were mandated by the DEP to cover the site with asphalt. On a mandated oil spill. In this case, we were able to acquire the asphalt as millions of the runways from the nearby Logan International Airport, another site of global landing. Thank you. <laughs>